All right, I have to say, I've been looking forward to this conversation all week. First of all... You, you really must not have enough to well, do. <laughs> and it's been a fun week. It's been a fun week. I mean, you've lived so many Super Bowl weeks. Uh -huh. the, my first Super Bowl week was post um, the uh, uh, Gulf War, uh, 1991, when Scott Norwood missed a field goal and the New York Giants beat Yikes. the Buffalo you, Bills. And yeah, you just had... The well, Buffalo Bills owner exactly. up there. Exactly. Uh, well, and, She's and probably very happy I brought this up. She is very it happy. It wasn't her team then. It wasn't her team, and you probably have a lot of Giants fans out there who just had a little PTSD sort of uh, kick in. What's changed about the Super Bowl uh, in I that don't, time? In that amount of time, it's just gotten bigger and bigger. I mean, it's a more spectacular event. Uh, I remember at ESPN when it went from being a day to two days to seven days to 14 days. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I don't think much has changed, though. It's still the most important event in the sports calendar in the United States every year. Uh, the games have gotten more and more exciting. The advertising around it's become more and more important. Uh, it's a spectacular event. Well, and it's funny, too, and, and this is right in your wheelhouse. You know, uh, Carol and I spent the last couple days broadcasting from Radio Row. Uh -huh. And we were talking with Brian Billick about the idea that Two years ago, you know, you were starting to hear a pretty consistent death knell for professional football. Uh -huh. Let me tell you, you look around the Miami Beach Convention Center, you would not feel that uh, right. today. What happened with football, in your estimation, from a consumer, from a fan, from a business perspective? I, look, I've never thought there was a death knell for the NFL. The NFL's popularity uh, has done nothing but rise there have been times and years in which the prime time broadcast ratings have declined a little bit or gone up a little bit, but they do a spectacular job of figuring out how to create new packages. I don't think the total audience, if you aggregate it, yeah. has ever gone down. I don't think anything's happened with football, and it's remarkably resilient in the face of uh, some level of controversies, concerns about uh, health and safety of the players. The league has responded. Uh, I think fans love the game. There's something uniquely uh, American about it, uh, which is spectacular. And I don't see any scenario under which the NFL doesn't continue to be the most popular league in the United States. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, the, the resilience, you're exactly right. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the business at hand. And, and for those uh, listening to us on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Business Week, I'm sitting here with John Skipper here in Miami uh, from the DAZN. From the DAZN. From DAZN. You are the chairman of DAZN uh -huh. and also the former president of ESPN. Of course, streaming. We got to talk about it and talk about it in the context of the history of media. Is this one of, if not the biggest inflection point that you've seen in your career in terms of media and sports? Well, in my career, I mean, the, it was an extraordinary inflection point when you went from a paucity of sports on broadcast, right? They did, the broadcast networks did less than a thousand hours a year of television. Uh, in my last year, uh, as president of ESPN, we did 90,000 hours. Um, so that was a, an inflection point of availability of right. content to fans. And that was cable, really, that created that, right. right? Yeah. And it was, of course, also a transition from an over-the-air broadcast signal to a right. more stable connection, whether it be satellite or coaxial cable. But this inflection point, which is moving from pay television to over-the-top streaming is going to be just as profound. I mean, look, it's already happened in music, and look how profound that is. Instead of going to your tower records and bringing home a sack full of vinyl, you pay a very small amount of money and have all the music, or 83%, I just made the number up, of all the music in the world available to you on your smartphone. That's a spectacular consumer experience change the business model, you now have, we're right in the middle of the movement of general entertainment, 
to over-the-top streaming, and all you read about every day is the introduction of Disney Plus. Here comes the new Peacock. What uh, what is the next series of content on Apple TV? What's HBO Max going to look like? What is Amazon going to do? What is Facebook going to do? Uh, it's a remarkable change. Over time, it's a better value to the consumer. It unbundles the bundle, which doesn't mean you won't have a reaggregation of over-the-top content. You will. And it also provides advantages in more volume. Yeah. You're going to go now from 1,000 hours to 90,000 hours to 2 million hours, and pretty much everything is going to be available. You're going to be able to pick and choose more, and then you have the advantage of interactivity, two-way communication, which will allow people to have personalized experiences, betting, fantasy, gamification, chat rooms, and and uh, conversations happening during the broadcast. So it's a profound change and a better consumer experience. The question is, what happens to the business models? Right, it, okay, so let's talk, I mean, let's get into it because everything you said sounds awesome, sounds amazing, especially from a consumer perspective, and yet, you know the joke that people will sit down to try and watch a movie on a Friday night and they'll spend an hour just on Netflix and by the time they decide what they're going to watch, it's time to go to bed. You know, uh -huh. I mean, that, that sort of uh -huh. paralysis. I, I'm more efficient than that. <laughs> well, you're a more efficient guy uh -huh. in general. But, you know, and that's just with a couple of platforms. Some of the things you've talked about haven't even fully rolled out yet. How is a consumer to make sense of what they're going to put their dollars to? Um, I, I don't actually know that this is literally what happens. But I think it's instructive to think about a family sitting around the dinner table and deciding what they're going to buy. And the winners are gonna be those people who are the first choice or the second choice or the third choice because not many people are going to subscribe to more than five or six yeah. services, which by the way may still include a light aggregated pay TV bundle, right? but they're going to add Netflix. I mean, Netflix is fairly ubiquitous now within a certain socioeconomic group of people in the United States. Even if you go to a place, um, if you go to Brazil, you know, the plurality of homes at a certain socioeconomic level and above all have Netflix. They have it in Canada. They, you know, they're going to have it in India and everywhere else. So the fight now is between HBO Max and Peacock and yeah. Disney and Apple and Amazon Prime for where are they in the lineup of which services people are going to choose. We are sports only, so we have to work our way into that consideration set. We have a very simple way to do that. That does not mean that it is trivial to execute, but we know from our experience in Germany, Japan, Italy, that if you have first tier sports content, you are going to make the cut. Right. In Italy, we have Serie A, which means if you're a Juventus fan, three out of every 10 Juventus games are owned to zone. It's the only way to watch them. We have a very large number of subscribers in Italy. Uh, same thing in Japan, where we have the J-League football, uh, soccer, and we have Japanese baseball. So we have a large business in Japan. We uh, have had, we have Bundes, some Bundesliga games in Germany. We've got a high business. It's easy to do. Yeah. It is not inexpensive. The technology is complex. The reason music happened is audio is easier to stream than video. The reason entertainment happens before sports is because archived entertainment that sits at the head end of uh, in the cloud is easier to you pull, just pull down. It down. Yeah. The hardest thing to do is we're going to have a live game and we're going to produce that and deliver it to you at the same time as everybody else. Uh, last year we did one hundred more than 100 games events in which we had an audience of over a million people 
watching the same thing at one time. I do not think anybody else in the world has had that experience. Uh, and that is, the complexity of that is why this will happen over a certain period of time. It's funny, I was just talking to somebody who said, when's the Super Bowl gonna be on um, uh, over the top? The Super Bowl might be very quickly over the top as a choice. Right. Exclusively over exclusively. the top. Yeah. This, it, you couldn't do it right now. You just couldn't, it wouldn't be stable, it wouldn't right. be a good experience. But if five million people wanted to do it because they weren't in front of, the, the, you know, they weren't at home or they didn't have a pay TV subscription, although Super Bowl I know is on broadcast, um, though most people get broadcast through pay TV, uh, you, that could certainly be a compliment, which I would urge the NFL to think about in their next round of deals. Well, let's talk about that very point because for a long time, media rights, when it comes to sports, have been, and keep me honest here, exclusive, right? I mean, and uh, you don't have so much of these sort of complementary situations. Is that changing? Is it changing fast? Well, it's interesting. It depends on where you're talking about. Um, at ESPN, our point of view was it is not acceptable to bifurcate the linear stream and the over the top. Right. Of course, the NFL did that on Thursday night. Yes. When they sold a linear stream to Fox and they sold an over the top stream to Amazon. Amazon, right. So I think you will see some uh, positioning and struggle and and I think some leagues will try to bifurcate the two. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you something ironic, that while I just said that, our point of view at, at the zone is that we want exclusive content. We may, in certain cases, be willing to be non-exclusive. I'd take the Super Bowl non-exclusively. Uh, right. But when we bought the Serie A rights in Italy, or the Japanese baseball rights, we bought them exclusively. They are not for it's okay if you want to get your pay TV subscription. We want to move people over. We want a transformation. We don't want to be a complimentary service. Right. And for those of you listening on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Business Week, I'm speaking with John Skipper of DAZN, formerly of ESPN. So as you think about sort of sport by sport, you guys have a really nice footprint in boxing, obviously here in the United States. You talked about some of your soccer slash football uh, rights overseas. What's the next big growth area for you that takes DAZN to the next level? Look, it is, you want to, what you need to do to build a subscription service, and we're in nine countries, uh, four continents. We're in Brazil, we're in Spain, we're in Italy, we're in the United States, we're in Canada, we're in Austria, Switzerland, Germany. You gotta start with something that matters. Right here, we started with Saul Alvarez, Canelo. He matters, so you can move people over. You got to start um, in Canada. We have a Sunday Ticket. Uh, you got to start with something that matters. You got to build around it, so that people will. You can retain their subscription. You can make sure they're there all the year, and that they watch more. If we can get people to watch five events in a month, doesn't matter. Five basketball games, five baseball games, it's almost certain that they'll stay with us the next month. So you gotta build out. So that's the threshold is five. Well, four is a threshold, just not for 80%. Yeah, yeah right, so, got it. And then you gotta build some library content, right? Ultimately, you're gonna have to build some library content. You start with primary sports, then you add secondary, tertiary sports rights, and then you add archival content, uh, beyond it to build the service. Yeah, and so, you know, one of the themes that we've been talking about throughout the day is this idea of the empowered player, you know, athletes really owning their own content, their own brands. How does that play into this new streaming world? Well, look, the, the beauty of streaming is you have infinite capacity. So the extent that athletes want to do programming around the games they play, they want to do behind the scenes, we have the infinite capacity to show that. We do a fair amount of that. Yeah. And, you know, we do doc, uh, documentary. Uh, the football season in Europe, you know, runs basically 10 months. 
So in those two months between, we run documentary product about those leagues to keep people for those two months. Um, so I think the empowered player has a much easier platform on right. over the top Are service. You, do you have a take that you can share about who the most forward-thinking leagues are around the world? Who's most progressive when it comes to this new media world? Look, I would start by saying that I don't think there's any league that is not believe that they need to play in this, that they're going to need to understand it, they're going to need to be at the forefront of it. Um, you know, you, you, uh, I always tip my hat to the NBA. They understand that being first, being technologically forward is a good idea. But look, the NFL on Thursday night right now is doing something yeah. almost nobody else is doing. When you're around the world, um, the, foot, the major football associations and leagues are there on this. Yeah. Uh, I cannot confirm the exact details, but the Champions League, controlled by UEFA in Germany, is going to be next year available solely on over-the-top services. Right. And so you got to look at that. That's the second most important right. It's the equivalent of moving um, the NBA or all of college football to uh, to an over-the-top service, right. which would be astonishing right. and transformational in the United States. I don't think, by the way, that's getting ready to happen. Right. Uh, but in, a, in other markets around the world, and our business is 90% outside the United States. We are the, the leading global over-the-top pure play sports streaming service in the world. And in most of the world, there are not, you, I, you can count them, right? One, two, three, four, five, four broadcast networks, one, two, three big pay TV providers, right. one, two, three, four big technological companies. In most of the world, there's an over the air, there's one or two players in pay TV. Right. So your ability to move faster is more pronounced right. there than it is in the United States, which is why we're concentrating to a large extent on the rest of the world. ROW, rest of the world. Uh, and for more on that Champions uh, League conversation, you can read Bloomberg and you'll get some details around that. Um, I do got to I ask would suggest that Bloomberg has it right. <laughs> I can't confirm anything, right. but they have it right. All right, there you go. On many things. Um, so when it comes to your job now, we've only got a few minutes left, what have you learned so far? You've seen so much over the course of your career. This is certainly a new adventure. What has jumped out to you? When you like go to a cocktail party or a dinner party, like what are you saying to people that's that sort of aha moment for you working at DAZN? Look, it's, it's, uh, it's not many of you have experienced it right, but it is astonishingly stimulating and fun to do something different. Uh, I'm aware of the irony, but it's also quite fun of having worked at the, by far the most important participant in the pay TV universe to sort of look, flip the mirror and look at exactly the opposite, which is to be the uh, disruptor, the challenger, is really fun. Yeah. Uh, again, I liked both positions. I'm not suggesting one is better than the other, but that has been an aha moment that, gee, until you try it, uh, you kind of don't know. The other aha moment for me is just that we, um, we've had the, op it's, it's the global part of it, right? Yeah. It is really fun to do business in the world. Uh, uh, I'm a very proud American. But it is really fun to travel and see the rest of the world uh, and, see, and sort of get the stimulation that business is done differently, regulatory is different, the broadband internet universe is different in different places. So to be in Spain and sort of understand what that's like. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I get to go to a lot of people, places people go on vacation. Uh, for work. I'm working. <laughs> Somebody's paying for the room. And so when you look back toward the United States, what have you learned about what either you can do differently at DAZN in the United States that hasn't been done before or that from a more structural perspective needs to be done for the U.S. to sort of keep up? Look, we, 
what we're learning is how to deal with different kinds of broadband infrastructure, different currencies. We're also learning a lot. You heard me say, if you watch five, five uh, games, you're unlikely to churn. That, that will be true here. We're learning how to do archival material that complements the game. We're learning how to do interactive things. So all these things will serve us well. And it's, if you're learning it in, in Spain, you don't necessarily learn it under the Hawkeye of right. the media in yeah. the United States. There is no more intense media uh, repertorial scrutiny and, uh, than there is here. And so it's, it's good to be able to try some of these things other places a little bit out of, the, out of a shining light. Uh, is there a sport that's growing maybe faster than people anticipate? We all know about American football. We all know about football, global football. Is there something that's coming up that you've seen that maybe people aren't quite appreciating? Look, the most important thing is it, it has to be local, right? This is exactly what Netflix learned. You've got to go in and do local language content. It's got to be relevant to a local audience. It is remarkable having been mostly uh, looking at this through an American lens for a long time, football is the universal sport, yeah. by which I mean soccer. Yeah. I mean, around the rest of the world, it is half of what people care about. Some places, it's three quarters of what people care about. You go into Italy, Serie A is the NFL, the NBA, MLB, and NHL put together. Amazing. I mean, who knows, it's in Spain. It's La Liga. The second most popular sport in Spain, MotoGP, right? So it's interesting. In Germany, handball is really, really popular. Yeah. But it's the Bundesliga just sits on top of everything. Soccer is the king. John Skipper, what a treat. Thank you so much for spending it's some time It's been a great pleasure, Jason. Right. Thank Thanks. you. Thank Thanks. you, guys.